Uh, good morning and welcome to this, the sixth meeting of 2018 of the Equality Human Rights Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off and off the table? Um, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Um, and I am seeking the agreement of the committee to take our approach on the forthcoming legislation, our consideration of the correspondence on the UK Scottish Audit and Accountability Framework, and our consideration of the Children and Young People Commissioner's draft revised strategic plan 2018 to 2020 and issues relating to our human rights inquiry. Our committee agreed to take these items at Meetings in private. Excellent. Thank you so much. Moving on to agenda item two this morning, we have um, a a consideration of an affirmative uh, statutory uh, instrument uh, on the Equality Act 2010, authority subject to the social economic inequality duty, Scotland Regulations 2018 in draft. Um, and this session will allow us to question the Cabinet Secretary this morning on the content of the draft SSI and plans for its implementation. And then we'll go into the formal motion and the part of the moving the, the motion. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, uh, we're grateful for you to be here this morning to move the SSI. There's a paper in your papers from the clerks uh, in Spice um, at Annex A about the purpose of the instrument. At Annex B um, is the purpose of instrument, sorry, and Annex A is the, the details. Members may wish to note that the Delegated Powers Committee has drawn our attention to its to comment it has made on the SSI and those are included in Annex C in your papers. There is also a letter from the Cabinet Secretary this morning on the Government's plans to implement the socio-economic duty at Annex D of your papers. And we have with us today the Cabinet Secretary, good morning Cabinet Secretary, morning. and uh, Colin Brown who is from the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to give us some opening remarks on the, the, the purpose and the detail of the SSI? Uh, yes indeed, uh, thank you very much Convener. Uh, good morning to you uh, and to uh, committee colleagues. Uh, always grateful for the invitation to come to committee to give evidence, uh, particularly pleased to give evidence on the Fairer Scotland duty uh, ahead of the committee's consideration of the, the draft regulations that I'm bringing forward. Uh, this duty is uh, an important one, uh, introducing a new requirement on ministers and on public bodies through the Equality Act 2010. It means that all strategic decisions made by the public sector must, from April this year, look very carefully at how inequalities of outcome uh, caused by disadvantaged can be narrowed. It's a duty with a purpose. It helps make sure that public sector bodies, including Scottish ministers, uh, consider inequalities of outcome carefully in decision making. And it makes it easier to hold public authorities to account for those decisions. And it also encourages better decisions uh, and should ultimately deliver better outcomes for people facing poverty uh, and disadvantage in Scotland. The duty also finally completes for Scotland the set of duties originally planned actually at a UK level in 2010, duties on equality, uh, on child poverty and now on socio-economic socio uh, inequality. <laughs> Uh, together, these three duties provide a strong basis to build a fairer Scotland that we all want to work towards, uh, and I'm very keen to ensure that these duties will work well together uh, over the coming years. To make sure the new duty works well in practice, uh, Scottish Government will be delivering a, a range of support. Non-statutory guidance will be published shortly, uh, informed by a consultation last year and developed in consultation with uh, a wide range of stakeholders, including the Equalities and Human Rights Commission and COSLA. We are also funding a new national coordinator post uh, at the Improvement Service to deliver training and to share best practice. And we're considering how to build on the support that we've already provided to uh, three local authority areas to set up their own uh, Poverty Truth Commission style bodies as well. So in terms of the, the draft regulations, as you know, Scottish Government is able to name public authorities to be listed under the duty if they meet the three-point test in the Equality Act. Uh, we consulted on an initial list of authorities based on our assessment of this list uh, and were able to add uh, a number of further bodies uh, suggested by consultees. Uh, newly established statutory bodies that meet the three-point test will be able to be made subject to the duty uh, through future regulations. Uh, the committee will have seen the letter that I've sent to the convener uh, that sets out some additional information and I hope addresses the matter raised by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform 
Forum Committee. Uh, so, with all that said, uh, convener, uh, more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to move straight to uh, committee uh, colleagues' questions. Mary Fee. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, um, Cabinet Secretary. I just have one um, very brief um, question that I'd like to probe just in a little bit more detail with you, and I'm referring to the letter that you sent to um, the, the, the Convener when you gave the, the, the background to this. And when you talk about um, how you would go about ensuring future bodies um, that would meet the three-point test um, in the Equality Act but haven't yet been established, and you go on to say that it might mean, for example, introducing new regulations covering a new range of bodies every two or three years. And I'm, I'm fully supportive of all the work that's been done to, to, to take this, um, this piece of work um, forward. And obviously we want to get to a place where the equality duties are completely incorporated and embedded into every um, public sector organisation, and that would lead to better outcomes. And I just wonder if you've had any more thought about how you would do that? Yeah. So it's important to distinguish that for, uh, if you look at the examples I gave in the letter, so for uh, new public bodies that in the legislation that establishes those public bodies, for example, the new Social Security Agency, because the legislation uh, sets up those public bodies by reference to Scottish ministers, uh, bodies such as that just automatically uh, become uh, subject to the duty because of the link uh, with, with the Scottish ministers. And that's really uh, straightforward. Uh, new uh, bodies like the Social Security Agency, you know, from the start, you know, it's, it should be in their DNA that this duty uh, has to be implemented as part of their big strategic decision making, uh, and particularly as they, you know, grow as an organisation as well. So it's, you know, uh, a particularly powerful tool uh, for them and a particularly powerful duty. With regards to uh, other uh, types of organisations that have to be established, as I say in the letter, we can't, while we know there are uh, new bodies to be established, new public health authority in the South of Scotland uh, skills body, um, because they're not um, designated designated uh, in the context of the Scottish Ministers and the legislation, uh, we will have to bring forward uh, regulations. My initial thinking is just to do that at regular intervals, uh, certainly to, to review at regular uh, intervals. Um, open to discussion and suggestion if people have other uh, preferences. Um, in terms of the bodies that wouldn't automatically uh, be subject to the duty without us bringing forward regulations. I'm not sure what the other options are uh, in terms of you know, bringing forward uh, regulations every uh, two to three years. I don't think that's particularly burdensome, bringing forward regulations uh, every two to three years. You know, it's something that, um, you know, as a government, we would be more uh, than happy to do, given the importance um, of, 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 this, of this duty. So it's more or less saying that, that as we go forward, you're, you're almost taking a belt and braces approach. To, to make sure that everyone is, is, is included. Yes, yes. We don't, I mean, we're, re we're really keen that uh, where we can apply <coughs> this duty, mm -hmm. uh, it can be uh, applied. Um, the great thing about, about the consultation actually was that we were able to uh, extend the list uh, of bodies that were subject to this duty. Um, that came, you know, as a result of suggestions from people who'd responded to the consultation. Um, and in terms of things like the Food Standards Agency uh, and Revenue Scotland, um, you know, those suggestions had come forward as a result of the consultation uh, responses. And, you know, we obviously therefore consulted with those bodies who, who were, you know, more, more, more than happy. So, you know, um, you know there's broad support uh, for, for this measure, you know, you know across the, the public sector. And by introducing regulations, say, every, <coughs> excuse me, two or three years, would that give you an opportunity to update any guidance that goes to all organisations? Aye. So, and I think that's a really important point. So, what we've done just now for, for, for April is we've, uh, we're introducing interim guidance. And I think your point about um, embedding duties, so that they really make uh, a difference on the ground. And part of that's about uh, cultures and about, about, about attitudes. So we've issued interim guidance, of course, based on consultation. But by having a three-year implementation phase, we will be able to work actually very closely with public bodies uh, to look really uh, closely at actually what works in practice, what's really helpful in practice, and actually perhaps you know what 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 is less uh, that, than helpful, so that when we issue the final guidance at the end of the implementation period, that actually it's guidance that's based on 
practice uh, and what supports uh, good practice. And that was the other reason for funding uh, the National Coordinator's Post uh, with the, the, the improvement service, because we want to work with people at a very practical level, uh, sharing best practice, so that this isn't something that people feel is imposed upon them, that it's just, don't want people to feel it's another burden, and that certainly hasn't been the response that we've received. People have been welcoming, but we want to help people uh, work with it so that it has a uh, maximum impact. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Very much. <coughs> Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, I, it's actually on the three-year implementation uh, period that I'd like to ask you about. I mean, th that seems quite a long time, and, and I don't have a problem with that. Um, I just wondered if you could explain the reasoning for this. Is there going to be um, some bodies which will have particular hurdles to clear before they can uh, be compatible with the duty? Yeah, and I think it's a, an, an interesting point about you know, how long should the implementation period be? I suppose I'm conscious that in terms of this duty, uh, it's about putting it as very hard uh, when organisations are making those big strategic decisions that right at the core of that is about tackling poverty and inequality. And I suppose I'm conscious that for some organisations, they're not making these big strategic decisions week in, week out. There's a bit of a, a cycle uh, to, to their business. You know, it may be you know, an annual budget. It may be the three-year uh, corporate plan. It may be those bigger uh, decisions you know, around infrastructure um, investments. So um, on balance, felt about th that three years was, was, was right. The other consideration, and this did come back through uh, the consultation, was you know, how do we ensure that this duty is very well knitted with public sector equality outcomes and also the, the duties and reporting duties uh, that local authorities and health boards have in particular around uh, child poverty uh, targets and child poverty uh, r reporting as well. So you'll be aware that the public sector equality duties uh, will be subject to, to review, uh, and that will be you know, later on uh, that this year. Um, again, this is an area that the Equalities and Human Rights Commission are very you know, active in. And so I am conscious that, um, and certainly from some of uh, the questions I've had from this committee and some of the views I've heard committee members you know, express either in committee or in chamber, that there is that feeling that the public sector quality duties could be working better. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, in terms of the review that needs to be done around the equality duties, uh, and you know that the kind of life cycle of you know decision making for bigger strategic decisions, three years felt, felt about right. I think one of our shared interests in this committee, I'm, I'm sure, right across this Parliament, is the idea that. Um, new policy or directives like this, which are aimed at improving the work that all, all bodies who are in the public domain uh, do towards equalities, um, do more than just sit on the shelf. And I think, um, obviously, I'm very supportive of this because I think that brings us closer to that. Um, but I think there will still be a variance between how bodies apply this. And you talked a bit about best practice, but what engagement have you had with um, public bodies to whom this will apply? Um, and what has their feedback been? I mean, are, there, are those some aspects of them resistant to it or um, just think this is another government diktat they'll, they'll have to find a way of ticking a box for? No, and I think um, people were very clear in terms of the consultation responses that what we didn't want and what the public sector out there most certainly doesn't want is a tick box um, exercise. Um, another thing that really struck me with respect to the feedback we got via uh, our consultation was that actually people wanted to be able to, to use this duty as a way to... Uh, prevent um, or deal with the causes of poverty and inequality as opposed to always mitigating uh, you know, the, the, the consequences uh, of poverty and inequality. And I think it is fair to say that you know, there's big broad support, good support uh, for this duty in principle. But I think inevitably uh, people will always have concerns about, oh, um, you know, how does this interact with these other duties. Um, and that's where we do need to work with people to ensure that we get that right. Um, that's why we're having an implementation 
period. Um, you know, so, so people are subject to the duty from April, uh, but we will be over the next three years, you know, having an ongoing active consideration of how things are working on the ground, proactively trying to help the public sector through, you know, the funding of the national um, post uh, through you know the the work that we'll do to you know constantly review and appraise uh, the interim guidance the work that's actually done with poverty truth type uh, commissions um, as well and that you know enable us to have that ongoing dialogue before we issue final uh, guidance and actually you know we have an open mind as to you know at the end of the implementation period, you know, whether I need to come back and make further regulations or indeed, you know, look at a bit of primary legislation to make sure the duties are uh, aligned. But it was really, I felt it was really important that given that this part of the Equality Act had laid dormant for so long, and actually, you know, it was something that we could do. Uh, and I'm of the view when you can do something, <laughs> you should get on and do it. And, you know, you can always tweak and refine, you know, as, as you go on. But I think it's really important, uh, given the scale of the challenge that we face in modern Scotland, that we get on and do things. And we can, of course, review and refine um, and make how we work in practice better. But we've got to go on and do it. Thank you. Thanks very much. And um, Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, Colin. So, just looking through the SSI, um, I wondered if the Cabinet Secretary could, could furnish me with some, uh, in her view, any practical examples of how this uh, duty may have on the agencies that, will, that include, in terms of on a day-to-day -day level. So, we often talk about, in the, in the policy notes around giving due regard to when making decisions, but what does that actually mean in, in, in real terms, in, in terms of how these bodies or organisations will make decisions or alter the decision-making process? Okay, so I suppose in terms of um, the types of decisions that these bodies could be making that we would uh, be expecting them to be given due regard to how they're going to narrow uh, you know, socio-economic uh, disadvantage. So, you know, for Scottish ministers, when we are making you know, significant announcements around significant investments uh, or you know, big new policy developments or you know, legislation, that you know, this duty has to be at the heart of that. Food Standards Agency, um, as, as, as you know, um, you know, have responsibilities around uh, healthy eating. Uh, you know, so there's an obvious uh, connectivity there. Um, in terms of uh, local authorities, it could be around their budget setting process. We would expect, you know, uh, their budget setting process to have the Fear of Scotland duty uh, to be very much um, at, at the heart of that. Uh, big strategic corporate plans. Um, it may be if. Um, you know, a public body was developing um, a new estate or a new uh, leisure facility um, that we'd be expecting, you know, these decisions uh, to be um, at the heart. Now, in terms of the interim guidance uh, that we have um, issued, it very helpfully, uh, and actually in a, a plain English manner, you know, um, lays out you know, some of the points you read about definitions, because it is important that we all have the same understanding about what we mean by um, inequalities of outcome and you know, socio-economic uh, uh, disadvantage uh, and how we you know, define socio-economic disadvantage, which you know, would be means living on below average incomes with little accumulated wealth, uh, leading to greater material deprivation, restricting the ability to access basic goods and services. And socio-economic disadvantage can be experienced both in places and in communities of interest, uh, leading to further negative outcomes such as uh, social um, uh, inclusion. And in terms of the, the, the process uh, ar around this, so, you know, I spoke a bit about, you know, what do we mean by, uh, you know, strategic decisions? You know, what do we mean by at a strategic level? So it could be things like local development plans, major investment plans, city deals, legislation, uh, budget, the you know, shape, size, location of an estate, local outcome improvement plan as part of community plan and partnership, locality plans, corporate plans, commissioning of services uh, would be particularly important as well. And with due regard, um, you know, the guidance speaks about how consideration needs to be uh, active, 
you know, in that uh, strategic uh, decision making uh, process. Uh, and it also involves uh, participation. Um, so it may be you know, easier to demonstrate that due regard has been paid uh, if an assessment involves, tho involves those who may be affected uh, by the decision. Uh, you know, that's an important point. Uh, looking at uh, the scale of the challenge and actually understanding uh, the inequality and the inequality gap in a particular community or in a particular area as well. So understanding the scale uh, of the issue in a particular uh, community interest group or a particular community um, is uh, important. Um, and, you know, you know, the, the, the interim uh, guidance you know, issues you know, a, a, you know, a very clear process uh, that I've touched upon for, for authorities to work through. I appreciate that um, comprehensive response, Cabinet Secretary. Um, could I um, probe a little bit further on that, <clears throat> in the sense that I guess this strikes me as uh, quite similar to some of the language used in, in other bills that the Parliament's looking at, for example, the Islands Bill, uh, where uh, local authorities, public bodies, uh, government agencies must have due regard to island communities when making decisions with a specific outcome. Um, and one of the things that we identified throughout analysis of that legislation was the what-if scenario if a decision is being made or will be made that will have a negative effect or a negative outcome. Uh, and the fact that there's very little ability to mitigate often uh, these decisions generally as a result of financial um, constraints. And, and if I could give an example, I think it may help the committee. Um, and I certainly by no means mean, want to pick on any specific local authority, but in my own area, in Reclyde Council, for example, uh, made a decision to close an um, alcohol um, day centre in the area, which I think had a very negative effect on socioeconomic <coughs> outcomes in that part of the world. Um, the, the, the policy, that, that policy decision was made uh, for financial reasons and limitations in their budgets. And I dare say they were identified a negative outcome that may come as a result of that closure. But what would this SSI or what would this additional duty change in that situation? The centre would probably still have closed. Or is this actually giving us a way to ensure that these decisions might not happen in the first place? I, I, again, I don't want to be specific <clears throat> or picking anyone in particular, but it, it just it's an example of a, a practical example. Okay, and you know, and again, I'm not not familiar, uh, you know, with, with that example. So you'll appreciate, you know, I would probably prefer to speak um, in, in, in broader terms. So it is imperative that when people are making decisions about, uh, let's just see, the provision of a service, whether it's um, you know an alcohol service or whether it's a community care, care service, uh, particularly, and I think there's a particular issue around, you know, the commissioning uh, of services, that they are able to demonstrate. Uh, publicly, and they need to prepare a public record uh, about how they are applying the Fear of Scotland uh, duty uh, to you know, big uh, strategic decisions. But of course, specific decisions can always be challenged. Uh, so they can be challenged you know, politically, um, and you know, members here um, won't need me to tell them you know, how, to, how to go about that. Uh, but also, um, in terms of the Fear of Scotland uh, duty, it can, you know, people uh, can explore judicial review. So it is, it is the law, <laughs> you know, it is in legislation, um, you know, people are, are meant to do it and people are meant to be uh, demonstrating how they're doing it, you know, with a, with a public record um, and, you know, ultimately people have political uh, avenues to pursue uh, and it could be subject to ju judicial review. That's, that's very interesting, very helpful. And my final one is just a technical question, if, that, if I may, around the definitions. Uh, Scottish ministers are listed as a <coughs> uh, public authority, um, and the, uh, the accompanying notes say that that includes the Scottish Government and their list of other agencies. Can I just check on a uh, factual point of view that that includes all publicly owned organisations, companies, subsidiaries? And if I give some examples of companies like David McGrain, McGrain for example, which is a publicly owned uh, organisation, uh, so, for example, if they were to make a policy decision, uh, you know, let's say timetable changes on a ferry, which would have a negative uh, outcome on a certain community, uh, would that be subject as a result of its relationship with the government or ownership of the government or its reporting lines into ministers? So I guess Scottish ministers is quite a wide and varied 
um, a statement. So I just wondered how far that actually drills down in terms of who who this, who's accountable in this situation. I'll, I'll ask Colin to, to respond to this in a moment. Um, but, but, but Scottish ministers, um, you know, in, in terms of what they, they talk about in terms of core and uh, main uh, government, uh, is as um, you know listed uh, in the guidance. So Scottish ministers uh, includes Scottish government. Accountant and Bankruptcy, Disclosure Scotland, Education Scotland, Scottish Prison Service, uh, Scottish Public Pensions Agency, Student Awards Agency for Scotland, Transport Scotland uh, and the new Social Security Agency uh, once um, established. Um, you know, so, you know, the organisation you, know, you mentioned isn't um, listed. It is important to remember that uh, there's a three-point test that has to be applied here and you know, th th this is where we are bound by the architecture of the original 2010 um, Equality Act. Uh, so um, there are three, three points that are important. So for an organisation to be listed in terms of this duty, uh, they need to either be based in Scotland or have a function that's in Scotland. They need to be devolved. And uh, I suppose this is where the, 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 the more challenging bit is, they, they need to be equivalent to uh, the English bodies. So uh, the 2010 Act lists a whole range um, of, of bodies uh, south of the border. And then we had to look to see where our equivalent body was. Hence, actually, the importance of our uh, consultation, because that you know, took a bit of um, exploring just because of different, um, you know, Organisations could be broadly comparable, but not ex exactly uh, the same, given the, the, the devolved um, settlement. But I'll check to see if Colin wants to add anything to that. Um, that not directly. The, the Scottish ministers would refer to bodies that are within the umbrella of Scottish ministers and statute. It wouldn't directly apply to a private company, because that's not set up that way. Company, it should, should but, um, well, clarify. If, if the company is publicly owned, if Scottish ministers are directing that company, then Scottish ministers are exercising functions of a strategic nature and they, of course, are subject to the duty. So some of these bodies may come into it through the back door. It would have to be looked at, I think, in the structure of a particular yeah. body rather than in the abstract, but they're not entirely out with the ambit of it. And, of course, bodies can voluntarily yeah. follow the principles of the duty without actually technically being subject to it. I understand. Okay. I, I guess, it, it, in, for example, in the uh, Gender Representation Bill, there was a specific schedule in the bill which had a list of agencies. There was therefore no ambiguity whatsoever around who was, who, you know, who, who, who would have to uh, work under, you know, this duty would apply to in that respect. Whereas this uh, perhaps is more open in the sense of if you, if, it's, if you have to indirectly go down the chain to work out if that is a public body or not, it, le it may leave some ambiguity as to whether they're covered I, or not. I, I'm not. I'm not sure that there is uh, ambiguity. I mean, we will take the opportunity to, to double check. Um, <coughs> but, um, you know, it's about whether, you know, a, a public body in terms of how they're set up by their founding legislation, you know, whether they are, you know, um, established or, or designated via... Um, Scottish ministers. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure there is... I think I would disagree that there's am ambiguity. The um, design of the list, to the extent, affects the powers and the existence of three three-point test, which yeah. affects what can actually be listed. So, as the Minister has already said, there is a constraint from the architecture. Yeah. And it is, you know, and, and there are differences here. So the public uh, sector, the bodies that are subject to the public sector equality duty are different from, you know, there's an overlap. Um, but so not all the bodies that are subject to the public sector equality duty, which is wider, are subject to the Fair of Scotland duty. But, you know, that's, you know, the, the, prime, the original primary legislation wasn't ours. It's not our architecture. So, you know, we're working within, you know, the constraints of that. And, I, and just getting on with it and making the best of it. Okay, thank you. Alex, do you want to come in with a yeah. um, Just a short supplementary, linked to the definitions. I still bear the scars, as do many people who were involved in the passage of the Children and Young People's Act, um, of the confusion regarding definitions around things like 
uh, the difference between well-being and welfare, uh, the triggers for information sharing. And actually, it's often in the interpretation of, of what we mean by legislation where things fall apart. So my question is also about definitions. Are there um, issues around language and interpretation which clearly have been raised in the consultation beyond who this, to whom this applies that we should be worried about? I think um, what people were absolutely calling for was clarity around definitions and approach. And um, in my view, you know, the interim um, guidance is clear around what is meant by socioeconomic disadvantage. Uh, I think it's clear around uh, the definition of due uh, regard. I won't, for the sake of brevity, um, read, read out the guidance. It's fairly, fairly uh, succinct. Um, but, you know, another reason, f you know, but the proof of the pudding is always in the implementation. It's actually how people are able to use this duty and how they're able to use it to good effect on the ground. So, you know, that's why uh, we also have an implementation period so that if there are issues about definitions and how they help or indeed hinder, that that's something we can revisit uh, either in terms of the final guidance uh, or, you know, revising regulations or indeed if we need to look uh, at, at some form of primary legislation, we'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, from your letter, we've got the three-year impl implementation plan, the National Coordinator Post, but another uh, fourth aspect of your letter that caught my eye was the development of a new funding stream, and that's offering small sums of money to help bring the diverse voices of people with direct experience of poverty and disadvantage more directly into strategic decision-making at local level. You'll know the work that the committee has done around about the voices of gypsy travellers and the voices of um, young people, people with with, with with disabilities um, and uh, people in our asylum and refugee community who had been, um, when we did our destitution inquiry, is, is this the type of um, people's voices that you would like to hear in this, as well as the wider, uh, um, you know, community voices? And I know that a, a huge part of the, the work that will be done is around about community input into the Fairer Scotland Action Plan. Um, Will, will these two things work together and what type of voices are you hoping to, to hear? So I, th I think helpfully we've made the connection between um, socioeconomic disadvantage or you know, income uh, poverty and you know, particular um, groups um, because we know there are um, particular groups of people that are m more at risk um, of, of poverty. And the work that we've supported um, so we've supported the, the, the Poverty Truth Commission uh, and we've also um, invested um, in three more local uh, versions of Poverty Truth Commission. So uh, we supported one in Dundee, Shetland, uh, North Ayrshire uh, and we're happy to continue to support um, you know, that, that type of activity. Um, I've certainly uh, engaged uh, with the new Dundee uh, body um, and it will be beholden on people to, you know, really reach in uh, to, to all of their communities as well. But, I mean, that's something that we'll keep a very, you know, close, cl cl close eye on. Um, so it's work that we support, it's not work that we lead. It's important that, you know, locally and that those with that lived experience um, are leading and guiding uh, this, this work. But it is important that we're always, I suppose, sense-checking with each other that given what we know about the high risks of exclusion and poverty for some particular groups, um, you know, so we know uh, that children growing up in, uh, you know, black or minority ethnic households, you know, that 37% of those children uh, would be growing up in poverty, and that compares to about 20% uh, of, uh, you know, their, their, their white peers. Uh, we know that children growing up in a, a, a house where there's another disabled child or a disabled adult, an elevated risk, children growing up in un houses of unemployment, and so, so, so forth. But I think in terms of the, the interim guidance, I think it's helpfully making, you know, that connection that when we're talking about socioeconomic disadvantage, which is rather burdensome. Legally, this is the, the socioeconomic duty, but we're calling it the, the Fear of Scotland duty because I think it resonates uh, more uh, with our uh, stakeholders. But in the 
um, interim guidance, you know, we're rec recognising that you know this is about income, it's about lack of wealth, it's about uh, people's background, it's about communities, areas of deprivation, um, so it's about uh, place, um, and indeed, you know, whether you're from a particular community that's at that elevated risk of poverty. Is that one of the reasons why the Scottish Government's keen to share the d data, the rich data that they have and the information that they have as a community resource in that sense on public bodies? And how do you make sure that you don't just have the usual suspects? Uh, because some of the voices that we've heard for are from are people who who would maybe not ordinarily engage in community projects like this, but would maybe be sitting outside that. How do we make sure that, that they're... they're um, experiences or lived experiences that are included in the, the process? So I think this is where it is uh, beholden on, on us all. And one of the things that really um, um, irritates me <laughs> is when people say, oh, you know, folk get sick of being consulted. Uh, and, you know, that, that's actually a demonstration that we are uh, going around consultation in the wrong shape uh, and, and, and manner. Uh, because people do want to be engaged. People do want to influence uh, you know, the resources and the decisions and the spend that affects their life um, on a, a daily basis. So if we're, if, 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 whether it's government or other organisations, if we're not successful in our engagement, that actually tells us we're going about it uh, the, the, the wrong way. And there are many, you know, you know different organisations and different communities, they don't need to be doing the same thing. Um, I think the work that the Poverty Truth Commission uh, has done has been highly successful. I think the work uh, that the more localised groups that I mentioned in terms of, uh, you know, Dundee, Shetland and North Ayrshire, you know, are going about this uh, in a successful manner. Um, the experience panels, um, so, you know, as, as, as another e example. So, you know, if, if we're not reaching communities, you know, we're doing it wrong and it means we need to try something else. Okay, well, so that's very reassuring. Uh, thank you. Any other final questions from members? No? Thank you so much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. We're going to move on to agenda item two, three, which is um, a debate on the motion to approve the SSI, on which we've just taken evidence from the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I ask this Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to motion S5M10560, Cabinet Secretary. Convener, I'm happy to move uh, the motion in my name. I don't have anything to add uh, other than what I've already said in terms of opening remarks and the um, answers uh, that I've given today to committee. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. It's now the opportunity for me to open for comments from colleagues. Anybody want to contribute to the debate? No, I think you must have answered all the questions, Cabinet <laughs> Secretary. Um, we have no uh, further uh, debate on uh, the matter. Can I uh, invite the Cabinet Secretary to wind up and, and press, uh, move the motion in our name? Uh, I move the motion in my name and uh, pre press the motion. Thank you. So the question is to committee is, is that motion S5M10560 is to be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are all agreed. Thank you so much uh, for that this morning, Cabinet Secretary. We are very grateful to you. Um, we are, I will now suspend committee for a short comfort break.
slightly comfy. Yeah. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, good morning and welcome back to the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Um, moving on to agenda item four this morning, which is our continual um, a evidence on the Historic Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Scotland Bill. Uh, we are just about concluding stage one on this bill. So uh, we're hearing from the Cabinet Secretary this morning, but before we move on to that evidence session, I'd like to state that last week the committee took evidence in private session from men with historical convictions who, uh, who plan to apply for the disregard. Uh, the clerks are preparing a note uh, on that meeting, which will be included in our Stage 1 report, and the two men who took part are happy to do that, um, although it will be anonymised. Okay, so I want to put on record uh, my thanks uh, on behalf of the whole committee to the men who met with us last week. I'm sure you'll agree that when they shared their personal stories, it put a very human face on what this bill actually means and how important the legislation uh, is uh, to them and how it will improve their lives once it's, it's enacted. Um, and I'm sure members will keep their stories very fresh in their minds mm -hmm. today when we talk to the Cabinet Secretary. So on that note, Cabinet Secretary, I'd mm -hmm. like to welcome you to committee this morning. Um, it, it's not often uh, a committee, you know, is going through a bill process when we are at one about how important the bill is um, and, and, and really see the difference it can make to, to people's lives. So we're uh, really happy to be doing this piece of work on this committee. Um, I'm keen for you to do, give us some open remarks, Cabinet Secretary. We have taken evidence for a number of areas, and actually the evidence session in private last week really just, you know, was the, the icing on the cake really for us. So, but we've got a number of questions for you anyway this morning. But if you could give us an opening statement um, and put things into context for us, for your point of view, that would be very helpful. Uh, convener, thank you uh, for inviting me this morning to give evidence on the historical sexual offences, pardons and disregards uh, bill. It may be helpful to the committee if I briefly set out the context for this legislation. This bill is intended to deal with the ongoing impact on people's lives of discriminatory laws which, discrimin which criminalised same-sex sexual activity between men. It makes provision in two separate but connected areas. It provides a pardon to people who were convicted of historical sexual offences for activity which is now legal, and it puts in place a scheme to enable a person who has been convicted of a historical sexual offence to apply to have that conviction disregarded so that it will never be disclosed as, for example, part of an enhanced disclosure check. The two schemes apply to offences which were used to prosecute sexual activity between men which, if it occurred in the same circumstances today, would be lawful. The pardon provides that a person who has been convicted of a historical sexual offence is pardoned for that offence if the conduct which constituted the offence would not be criminal on the day on which the bill comes into force. The pardon is symbolic. It provides formal recognition that the person should never have been punished. In contrast with the approach taken in England and Wales, it is automatic. A person does not need to make an application in order to be pardoned. The bill also provides for a disregard scheme, which enables a person with a conviction for a historical sexual offence which criminalised same-sex sexual activity between men that would now be legal to apply to have the conviction disregarded. So that information about that conviction does not show up, show up in any disclosure check carried out when that person is applying for certain work or voluntary roles. So while the pardon is a symbolic matter, the disregard scheme is a real practical benefit attached to it. The bill provides for a presumption in favour of granting the disregard. That is to say, the disregard is granted unless it appears that either the conviction uh, is not actually for historical sexual offences at all, or that the conviction was for an act that remains illegal today. For example, because it concerns non-consensual conduct or because of the age of the complainer. Where a disregard is granted, the bill provides that official records must be updated so that the information about the conviction is either removed or else annotated in such a way as to make clear it should never be disclosed. 
The Bill also provides that where a disregard is granted, the person who was convicted of the offence is to be treated for all purposes as not having committed the offence, not having been charged, prosecuted, convicted or sentenced for the offence. This means it would not be lawful for, for example, a potential employer to discriminate against a person because they have such a conviction. I hope, convener, uh, this is uh, helpful. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions from committee members. Right, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to take uh, members in turn this morning because we've all been uh, pursuing uh, different areas in, in the bill. Uh, I'm going to start with Alec Cohan. Thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary and our colleagues from Scottish Government. Um, I think we were very struck by the evidence we've had at stage one. It's been compelling, it's been dignified um, and uh, v very striking. Um, one of the things we learned in an earlier session was that in countries where this has happened before, for example, Germany, there is an element of financial compensation paid out uh, to those who apply for disregard, uh, an automatic threshold, a uh, basic payment, and then an enhanced payment if additional um, circumstances are identified around that. Now, it was quite clear that the people, the majority of the people we took evidence from were actually um, hadn't even thought about compensation and was certainly not a motivating factor for them and, and, and suggested it was neither here nor there to them at all. This was about righting a wrong. But we also heard from people who suffered financially. They perhaps had to pay a fine as part of their um, sentence or very significantly through their career prospects um, as a result of having a criminal conviction, which uh, we heard from one gentleman who certainly was, was clear that it had hampered his career progression. What consideration has the Scottish Government given, if any, to uh, awarding a, at least a basic level of compensation, perhaps with an enhancement, uh, to those who come forward? Well, I think you raise a very important issue. When we were considering um, introducing a piece of uh, this piece of legislation, um, the principal focus had been on providing uh, a disregard, uh, in particular for those who continue to have uh, these offences on their criminal records, and also uh, providing that uh, pardon uh, uh, across at the board to those who had been convicted of these offences as well. And as you said yourself, it was about righting a wrong and uh, recognising that, that there was legislation uh, in this country uh, that was discriminatory and it was state-sanctioned uh, legislation. So the, uh, the representations which we'd received and the views which had been expressed to us were about the uh, uh, apology, uh, pardon and also the provision of a disregard. The challenge I have around the idea of uh, compensation is that although there were a small number, a limited number of men convicted of these offences, there were a greater number of men affected by the very fact that there was legislation which discriminated against men uh, who may be gay or bisexual. And the reality is that it would have impacted on their lives in different ways, uh, although they may not have been convicted of offences. Therefore, I think there is a danger that you create an arbitrary divide between those who were convicted of an offence, but those who were not convicted of an offence, but were also affected by the very fact that there was state-sanctioned legislation that discriminated against the type of sexual relationship that they wished to have. In my view, I'm, uh, I'm of the view that I think it's an arbitrary division which I don't think is appropriate. Uh, and to some degree, it creates a hierarchy of those who uh, may have been uh, more affected by it than others, when in reality, uh, this was discriminatory legislation uh, that should never have been in place in the first place. So uh, for those reasons, it, it, uh, and uh, in considering the matter, that's why I don't think a compensation scheme would be appropriate because it would create this arbitrary divide uh, between those who were convicted and those who weren't uh, and doesn't recognise the fact that there were probably hundreds, if not thousands of men, uh, well, certainly there were thousands of men affected by the very fact that there was discriminatory legislation in place, but they may never have been convicted uh, of an offence and a compensation scheme potentially introduces that arbitrary type of divide, which I don't think is appropriate. Thank you. 
That was certainly the view expressed by the majority of uh, people who gave evidence. And uh, I think we are probably of a mind or coming round to that way of thinking as a committee. It was uh, amusing when one of the witnesses who gave evidence privately last week, he said, well, you could always pay me my 40 shillings back as a fine. But I think that actually that his point that he went on to say was exactly what he said about creating that arbitrary yeah. distinction. So we hear that well. Um, if I can move on, um, with your permission, Convener, to the fact that um, whilst it's clear what this does to criminal records, and whilst I think we all accept that there will not be a deletion of the criminal record, because it's important that we not accidentally preside over a, a sort of re revisionist history of what happened in that period, but that these these facts will be disregarded. There is evidence of sentencing in other places as well. For example, in a very small number of cases, there may be medical records which show medical interventions that were taken in the 50s, 60s and early 70s um, as a, a result of sentencing or as a, a, as a, a sort of alternative to custodial sentencing sentencing, which, um, whilst may not be appropriate to be deleted from medical records, may um, there may need to be a mechanism by which um, the appellants can have uh, something attached to their medical records explaining uh, what happened to them or having them somehow disregarded as well. Is there any consideration been given to that side of things? Well, there is, uh, the list of provisions around medical records are somewhat different from obviously that of uh, criminal records. Uh, the challenge here is that uh, uh, this is a piece of legislation that's addressing uh, uh, individuals who have criminal convictions for offences which today would not be considered to be a criminal offence. Uh, the challenge with medical records is that uh, the medical procedure took place and it may be that, although there are issues about uh, whether that medical procedure should have taken place or not, and our views around that have changed, the reality is that it took place and it's part of their medical uh, history. And it, it is, it's, in my view, it's extremely difficult to erase that from their medical records. Um, I also think there is a, a, a potential risk around someone who's undergone a a particular form of medical procedure that their medical records uh, are no longer complete in terms of historical medical treatment that may be relevant at some point in the future for other procedures or other treatments that would have to be taken into account. Um, although, uh, you know, it'd be for the committee to, to seek medical advice on exactly whether that would be entirely, if that's entirely correct, but my, my suspicion is that it would be important. The other thing as well is that um, medical records are only disclosed uh, in very limited circumstances, which is very different from criminal records. Uh, and very often medical records would only be disclosed to uh, uh, other clinicians for the purposes for them to be aware of that as well. It's not the type of information that would be disclosed, uh, for example, through a disclosure check and someone seeking employment uh, as well. So. Circumstances when that information would be provided is different. I think there is an issue about the potential for someone's medical history no longer being complete if you were to erase certain uh, medical procedures. Uh, and the other element I think is worth um, keeping in mind that there is, an, uh, there is a process that um, patients can go through in uh, accessing their medical records and also uh, challenging issues that may be contained within their medical records. Um, uh, if they chose to do so. But I think the purpose for which medical records would be used is very different from that of criminal records. And uh, I do think there are some potential uh, practical and clinical challenges around altering people's medical records, just given that it is part of their medical history. And final question for me, if I may convene. Um, and in respect of those people who are living in the United Kingdom now, who have criminal records for the offences that we're talking about, which are no longer offences, but were uh, prosecuted in other jurisdictions, so overseas, for example, um, how will this bill apply to them? And how, um, or how can we extend the provisions of this bill to ensure that people who are living in, who are subjects of this country, um, can have the disregard irrespective of where the sentence was handed down? So the disregard replies to um, legislation uh, which um, is relevant to uh, Scotland or the UK. Um, uh, the challenge you have in extending it from a, you know, a, a, 
an extra, uh, you know, jurisdictional basis is that uh, the application of laws in other countries is different from that of obviously here. The thresholds are different. The uh, the rationale behind it uh, will be different. Uh, but it's worth keeping in mind is that the disregard is to remove it from their criminal records. It, Disclosure Scotland would not normally hold information relating to offences that took place in other jurisdictions on their criminal records here. So if a disclosure check took place, they wouldn't necessarily hold that information, so it wouldn't be disclosed at that particular point. The only time where uh, I understand Disclosure Scotland it consider um, offences which have taken place out with uh, our jurisdiction is when an enhanced disclosure check is undertaken. Uh, and in uh, those circumstances, that would broadly relate to uh, protected persons' roles, so working with children and young people. And that would, by and large, deal with offences that relate to um, uh, child sexual offences uh, that they may, may wish to check for uh, in other jurisdictions. They have an arrangement in place with, um, I think it's 12 other EU states at the present moment for the sharing of that information, uh, uh, as and when it is appropriate. Uh, but uh, the nature of the disclosure checks that would take he place here for uh, 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 for employment, even if it's an enhanced disclosure check, we didn't necessarily have the information uh, of uh, prosecution in an R jurisdiction if it wasn't relevant uh, to the post that the person was applying for uh, or working within. But equally, uh, the challenge we have is that the thresholds the purpose for the legislation, the nature of how it's been applied in another jurisdiction uh, would uh, will be different from ours. We wouldn't necessarily have access to, for example, court records uh, in the same way to be able to scrutinise that in, in detail. So that's why the legislation uh, is limited to Scotland and the UK for the reasons that I've mentioned, because of some of the practical uh, and operational difficulties that would come from that, but also uh, given that this is information very often Disclosure Scotland wouldn't hold anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Just very quickly, Cabinet Secretary, before I move on to our next uh, uh, colleague, um, the, the questions that Alec Coham has been asking on compensation have been questions that he's, he's, he's continued to ask uh, everyone, and we've gathered lots of evidence on it. But last week when we heard from the gentleman who says, what, what are you going to do, give me my 40 shillings back, <coughs> he then went on to say, actually, if there is a compensation <coughs> scheme, we should the money should actually be spent on awareness raising of the, the act when it comes into force and support, whether that's legal aid support or other support for people um, who uh, uh, have, you know, need, need that support to, to navigate the system. And I just wondered whether that's something that the, the government would be considering rather than you may, maybe an, an arbitrary com compensation, you know, scheme in that sense, actually using that money to, to raise awareness and support people. So one of the things we will do um, um, uh, with the uh, with the will of Parliament in supporting this legislation is look at having a, a public information campaign around it. Uh, and the way in which we intend to look at taking that forward is working in partnership with third sector organisations to publicise the provisions within the legislation, the process for uh, applying for it. So uh, the idea of uh, providing financial resources to highlight awareness uh, and understanding of this legislation is something we're already giving consideration uh, to. Your second point on the issue of legal aid. My intention is to make this an application process uh, that is as straightforward as possible. Uh, I would like to avoid the need uh, for individuals who wish to make an application uh, for a disregard uh, having to engage any other uh, professional expertise in supporting them in making that application. Uh, and we're giving quite a lot of thought to how we can make sure that the form that has to be completed is as straightforward as possible to give us the necessary information that then allows uh, the application to be taken forward and to be uh, considered. So I want to avoid it becoming one which is uh, a process which uh, people feel they have to take legal representation. The element where someone may wish to consider whether they require legal uh, representation is if they appeal uh, a decision not to have the offence removed from their criminal records. And the appeal mechanism is that once uh, uh, once I've given consideration to it, is that what would then happen is that uh, they can appeal to a sheriff uh, for uh, the matter to be reconsidered. And what we are doing is giving consideration to the existing legal aid rules 
around uh, how legal aid may be available to someone in those circumstances. So uh, between the public information campaign and also making sure it's a straightforward application process, but also alongside that, uh, looking at the existing legal aid rules uh, for the appeal process, um, I would hope it would give people assurances around our commitment to try and make sure that the legislation it works as effectively as possible, but also it provides additional support to individuals as and when it's appropriate, should they require legal representation. OK, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I think there's a few more detailed questions from some of my colleagues on, on most of these areas, but I'm going to move on to Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary Patrick. Thank you for coming in. Um, everyone that we've taken evidence from has been very, very supportive, warmly welcomed uh, the, the automatic um, pardon. Um, a small number of people um, did question whether or not the disregard scheme should be automatic as well. But we did take more evidence, and especially the evidence from Police Scotland um, explained to us that some of these offences may well still be offences and therefore a, an automatic disregard wouldn't be possible. Also, a lot of them were prosecuted under... Um, quite obscure bylaws and, you know, breach of the, of the peace and things like that. And even further, that some men may just wish to keep this in their past and not have it all brought up again. Um, so we did then go into um, speaking about the application process and the convener has um, touched on how you're going to publicise that. Um, but the form itself... Um, we, we saw the English version last week and um, it, it was put to us that perhaps it was maybe a little bit overcomplicated. Um, and you did mention just now that you want the process to be as simple as possible. Can you give us any indication at this stage of what a Scottish form may look like? Well, can I just deal with the initial points you were making about, their, uh, about the issue of an automatic disregard? Because I think it is important to recognise is that the way in which we've drafted the bill is to deal with both common law and statutory uh, types of offences. So, for example, common law offences such as breach of the peace that, peace that someone may have been convicted under, um, it won't be until we scrutinise the uh, police records and also the court uh, uh, reports that we'll be able to get a better understanding of exactly what the nature of that offence uh, was. And you're right to point out that some of these uh, offences may still, uh, the individuals have been convicted for, may still remain criminal offences if it was non-consensual, if it was someone that was under 16, etc. Uh, so that's why the disregard process needs to be one which is a, a scrutiny process uh, in order to validate the, the right to having it uh, disregarded. In terms of the process, one of the benefits of um, uh, the process being in place in England and Wales is that we can learn from their experience. Uh, so the issue about the forms being overly complicated um, is one of the issues that we've already identified. Uh, I can't set out to you specifically just now what the form will look like other than to give you an assurance that we are trying to make sure that it is a very straightforward, simplified process uh, 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 and, uh, and to try and achieve that as best as we can. Um, uh, what will be extremely important is that I, I'm conscious that many of these offences are offences that occurred um, uh, a considerable period of time uh, ago, is to try and make sure we capture as much information from the person that's making the application as possible. So I've got, you know, these are these are offences that will be pre-1980, people's recall of dates, etc., and exact circumstances may have changed as well. So um, it's important we allow them to provide as much information as possible for us to take into account. But then when we draw down the, the criminal records uh, from Police Scotland and also from uh, the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service, that will give us a bigger uh, uh, and a bigger level of information and detail around these matters. So I can't give you that specific uh, information at the present moment in terms of the forum, other than an assurance that we are learning from experience in England and Wales and seeking to draft it in such a fashion uh, that it is one which is, is straightforward. I would I would anticipate some road testing to be undertaken before it goes live. Uh, so working with some of the third sector organisations and engaging with individuals and testing out how straightforward they find the forum uh, will be one of the things that we'll give consideration to before we introduce it. 
Okay, thank you. And um, so, so once the scheme is publicised through third sector organisations, Disclosure Scotland have already um, written to the committee to say that, that they would be happy to, to help in that regard. How do people go about the application process? Where do they find the form? Is it downloadable? Can you get it in paper? How, you know, how's it going to work in practice? The intention is that um, it should be one that can be downloaded, uh, so you can take it off the web uh, and uh, uh, and fill it in uh, and complete it. Um, I don't want to say that you'll be able to fill it in online uh, because I don't think we have, and I, from a technical point of view, I don't want to uh, say that that's definitely going to be possible if there are technical issues or problems around doing that. It should be possible, I would have thought, but I'm, uh, I'm not an IT guru. So, uh, uh, but the intention is that they should be able to download that form. They'll be able to also uh, uh, contact, I would hope, some of the third sector organisations we're working with who will be able to send them on forums that may have a link on their website, Scottish Government website, uh, contacting us, MSPs, and just downloading uh, the form or sending the form out to them. So it should be an open, transparent and readily accessible uh, system, which, uh, given the nature of the information that will go alongside the form, I would expect some explanatory notes just to explain to people the bits that they're looking for in the different sections of it. Uh, should make it as straightforward as possible. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and it, the convener touched on legal aid, and it's it's actually really reassuring that um, hopefully that's not going to be an issue if it's going to be quite a straightforward process. But what about emotional support? Because I think that um, certainly given the evidence that we took last week, um, you know, there, there may be men out there that, that find it very difficult mentally to, to drag all this up again. How, how do you think we should handle that? Well, one of the things that, uh, and I think that's a very valid point, um, uh, and uh, it's also part of the reason for not having an automatic disregard, because there will be some who will choose, it's in the past, I don't really want to engage in this, and I want to leave it there um, as well. Um, I, one of the things that um, I'm happy to explore is whether there is, a, a, if there is some assistance we can uh, seek through some of the third sector organisations that may be able to provide some support to individuals that may require assistance in completing the forum. And that may not just be the actual physical, practical assistance, but it may also be that emotional support in going through it and reliving something in their past that um, uh, they've, uh, they've found difficult. Um, and we can we can work with them to see if there's a way in which that can be achieved. So um, I'm happy to take that point away uh, and to explore with them if there's a, a, a mechanism and a, a way in which we can provide some of that support uh, both practically and emotionally uh, for individuals that may require it. That's very reassuring, thank you. And just finally, do you have any idea how many men this is likely to affect? The, the scheme in England and Wales has been uh, operating since 2012. Uh, to date, they've had uh, just over 250 applications, I think it's 254 applications uh, to date, uh, although we can get that confirmed. Uh, for you, is it 254? Um, they've had 254 valid applications. Uh, that's once they exclude applications relating to, for example, assault or fraud or offences that had nothing to do with. Um, so if you take a proportionate share of those, um, that's over a five-year period, we would, you could anticipate around 25 applications here in Scotland. However, the definition uh, of a sexual offence within this bill is much wider than it is in England and Wales. So potentially it could draw in a greater uh, number. The other flip side to it is that uh, it, it's worth keeping in mind is the requirement for corroboration in Scotland, uh, which is not the case in England and Wales, which could, on the other side, actually reduce the number of cases because there were less convictions in Scotland as a result of the requirement for corroboration. So I can't be accurate other than say that our best estimate is on the basis of experience in England and Wales, which would suggest to us that's a mid-20s uh, number of applications, but there is a potential for it to be greater given that, the number, uh, given that we have a broader definition around sexual offences, uh, which allows us to take in a much wider uh, potential group here. Uh, but even within that threshold, if it's 25 or more, um, I think it's a, it's going to be a, of a scale which is very limited uh, and certainly very manageable. Okay, thank you.
I think there's some variables in that. We heard from Stonewall UK, who suggested that, that many people in England and Wales hadn't applied because the application process was too complicated and, 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 and too much for them. So, uh, you know, there's many variables in this. So I think we'd just be ready, I think, is the, <laughs> is the, the watchword here. Um, Mary Fee. Thank you, Convener, and good morning um, to, to you both. Um, the, the pardon will apply to all men, whether they are living or, or dead. And it's individuals who are dead that I want to um, ask you about, Cabinet Secretary. Because there may be circumstances where the fam a family want to clear the name of a relative who, who is dead. Um, and, and in previous um, evidence sessions, um, I've used this particular example. And, and while I accept it may be at an extreme of one scale, um, the circumstances around it will, will be the same for many families because there could be a situation where an individual has taken their own life because of a conviction. Um, the shame and the trauma of the conviction has been too much for them and they've taken their own life. And if we set that to one side for, for a second, there will also be individuals who have lived with the shame and the trauma of the conviction every single day. And it may have affected the way they have led their life. It may have affected their, their, their job opportunities um, and, and how they have conducted themselves. And the family will be acutely aware of that. And families may also be aware that if the individual was still alive, they would apply for the disregard. So is it something you have given any consideration to or will you consider doing something with this? So we have given some consideration to this and I recognise the point uh, that you are uh, making. I think it's a very valid um, uh, issue uh, to consider. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that the reason why there is no provisions in the bill at the present moment is on the basis that um, the disregard is for the purposes of a disclosure check and uh, it wouldn't apply in uh, circumstances where the person uh, is dead. Um, alongside that, the police would not normally hold criminal records on someone who's dead as well. Uh, and the criminal records are an important element of the checks around whether the disregard should be applied uh, at the same uh, time. Although I do understand that in some circumstances, families uh, may feel that they would wish the disregard to be applied despite the fact that it's not, it's for the purposes of, uh, would you call it, it's for a disclosure check uh, purpose. Um, I'm happy to give further consideration to it. Um, uh, uh, and if there is, a, if there is a, a means by which it could be achieved, I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. Um, and I suspect the number of cases would be very small anyway. However, um, just one of the warnings I would put alongside that is that it, very often families may not have the level of detail that will be necessary for us to be able to undertake that check properly um, because the individual who is convicted for the offence is no longer with us. And if we can't access the, uh, the criminal records because we no longer hold them uh, and Police Scotland no longer hold them, there is a potential danger that they could apply for a disregard um, and even with the presumption favour of the disregard, is that if we do not have the necessary background information and the criminal records, we could end up saying that the disregard does not apply. And in those circumstances, you are at risk of compounding the anxiety and the concerns of the family. So, I, I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm not in principle opposed to it, but I do think there are potentially unintended consequences that could come from it as well. Uh, and I think we just need to understand those risks uh, uh, more fully um, uh, uh, before making a judgment on whether it would be the right thing to do or not. But that's the principal reasons why it's not in the bill at the present moment. But mm -hmm. if the committee, uh, given evidence that you've heard, are minded that, the, that you do think such a provision should be in the bill, um, I'll certainly consider that once I've received your stage one report. No, I, I appreciate um, your, your comments, um, Cabinet Secretary, and I, I welcome your willingness to, to, to look at this. One of the things that we have heard in previous sessions, that even if the family could get a letter to say that, given the circumstances, your relative would not have been convicted today, some, some kind of letter, and while I accept it's still symbolic, and I appreciate the obstacles around lack of information about the conviction, but, but I think it is something... Um, that a number of organisations would appreciate, and I know a number of families would appreciate, and I, I think it's something maybe the committee should look at, how, how we could do this, but I accept the comments you made about that there, there could be convictions that you say would be disregarded that would still be a crime, because we don't know the, the, the information and the detail. 
So there, there are, as I say, there are potential uh, negative consequences as well, and um, I think it's just got to be careful in, in, with the intention of trying to do the right thing for families is that you could potentially compound the issue as well. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm very, I'm very open to considering the, the committee's views on these matter, uh, matters in its stage one report, and we can reflect on that. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Annie Wills. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, a lot of my questions that I was going to ask have been asked and answered already. Um, just one question from me. Obviously, the list of offences on the bill itself is really extensive. Do you think they are extensive enough, or, is, or will there be scope in the bill to add more offences should there need to be? Yeah, I think that's an important issue um, because it is. We've taken a much wider definition in the legislation in England and Wales, so covering both uh, common law and also statutory um, uh, offences. Uh, what we have also uh, put in place is a provision which is, if you like, a catch-all provision. Uh, what we are conscious of is that there may be some individuals who were prosecuted under local bylaws and yeah, in some local authority areas, bylaws which you know we've got no real knowledge of and it would only become apparent at the time of uh, when the person makes the application and then we consider the court records. So uh, as ever, the danger in listing things is that you leave something out. So um, the catch-all provision we've put in there is to allow us to pick up on any convictions that relate to some of these obscure bylaws that may have been used by local authorities um, uh, to ensure that individuals don't find themselves um, excluded from the scheme because we just weren't aware of that bylaw. And I suspect some of these local authorities probably aren't aware of these bylaws now uh, that were put in place many, many decades ago. So um, so I think we've got the, uh, the broad range of statutory and common law provisions right. Uh, and it's very broad, but that catch-all allows us to make sure that any obscure bylaws that have been uh, used, that we can also uh, make provision for them as well in considering a disregard request. Thank you for that. Yeah, we, did, we did hear last week about, mm -hmm. I think it was the Cleansing Act of 1839 of Edinburgh District <laughs> Council. So, <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's a lot of... A lot of You've got to scrunch it. Oh, there was lots of provisions in it that were very interesting, but including including in that was conduct in a public toilet. So uh, it was very interesting. Um, so we don't we don't envy your job and and, and uh, looking through all, all of those records. Um, Jim, Jamie Green. Thank you and uh, good morning, panel. Um, I may just start by adding a welcome to this bill. It's uh, it's uh, I think there are obviously learnings to be had from the bill in England and Wales, and I think we have an excellent opportunity in Scotland to shape a bill that, that, that meets its intentions. So uh, I, I warmly welcome it, so thank you. Um, I have a couple of small, short questions. The first one is if someone currently resides and lives in Scotland but was convicted of, of an offence in England and Wales in the past, would they have to use the English and Welsh system or would they be able to take advantage of the Scottish legislation? Um, if they were convicted in England and Wales, they would need to use the English and Welsh system. Right. Uh, that leads me nicely into my next question. Uh, which uh, is around picking up on Annie Wells' point around the, the wider scope of this bill. Uh, looking at the form, the application form that we saw last week for the English and Welsh scheme, uh, it, it stated specifically on it, and we raised this with some of the evidence uh, 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 sessions, witnesses, uh, that they could not apply for a disregard if the conviction took place, in, for example, in a public lavatory. So they were of the understanding that if they were in England and Wales, they would not be able to apply for discard, but they could in Scotland. And I think that does open up an element of confusion over uh, around, I think, when this goes public, whether people out there will be thinking, is my conviction you know, covered under this mm. legislation or not, given their experiences perhaps of the English and Welsh system. So how do we address that so, so that when it does go live in Scotland, uh, people will be very forthcoming with their applications for disregards. So I think you do you highlight uh, an important issue because the, the disregard scheme in England and Wales is limited to crimes of gross indecency and buggery and doesn't cover offences uh, used to uh, criminalise soliciting, uh, which uh, were not limited to soliciting for uh, prostitution, etc. So there's, it is a much more limited uh, provision. Um, I think that's part of the challenge for the public information campaign, um, trying to find, um, uh, uh, trying to 
find ways, sensitive ways in which to explain how it operates and the types of offences that are uh, covered by it, that a disregard can be applied for as well. Um, uh, but I think that's got to be carried out in a, in a sensitive fashion because we don't want to compound what was discriminatory legislation in the past by many people no longer being aware of it by unnecessarily, what you call, um, a, a, a raising un undue a awareness of it as well. So I think... Um, uh, I think that would be part of uh, the, the challenge for the, the public information campaign and helping people to understand. I, I hope it will be a process that for those who, um, even if they don't understand the, the legalities of it and the, 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 the offences which are covered by it, if they have been convicted of an offence of this nature, that they feel that it is an open and accessible process that is um, straightforward and that they feel they can apply even if they're unsure. Uh, to check. So, uh, so I think that combination of the public information and also the, uh, the, 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 the open nature of the application process can help to address some of those issues and potential confusion that may be there. Uh, thank you for that answer. It's uh, very helpful. Um, my other question is, uh, again, I suspect I know what the answer will be, but I'll ask the question nonetheless. Um, we explored in previous sessions the situation around people who are current or former members of the armed forces in the UK who uh, either worked in Scotland, who currently reside in Scotland. Um, in fact, there are, there are instances of people who uh, were discharged from the armed forces for being gay, um, but committed no common law or statutory offence, um, who will not be covered under any legislation, but either in England and Wales or indeed in Scotland. Uh, now, as a committee, we have written to the MOD, who uh, understandably are um, uh, aware of the situation, for their views on it. Um, or indeed, we've written to the UK government for their views on this. But I do wonder if, if, you, if we have a, a Scottish resident who served in Scotland, who perhaps was uh, convicted in the armed forces under an English and Welsh law within the jurisdiction of the armed forces, and still resides in Scotland. In other words, imagine they've never crossed... Hadrian's Wall, but still, are nonetheless, are unable to take advantage of this legislation. Is there any way that we, we, there could be some more exploratory work done uh, through the legalities of this, or if, if any of those people could take advantage of the Scottish legisl legislation? So I think the committee's identified a very important issue here, um, and I'm grateful for you sharing a copy of the letter that you've uh, written to the Ministry of Defence on this issue. And I think there is an opportunity here for the Ministry of Defence to uh, recognise that um, as, a, as wider society is righting a wrong, uh, there's an opportunity for the military to right a wrong as well and to look at their existing uh, military rules, uh, previous military rules applied in this area, and the way in which they were discriminating, they were discriminating nature against individuals within the armed forces. Uh, this bill is drafted because it, it focuses on the uh, 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 Scottish criminal law. Um, and if they, were, uh, if they were convicted under uh, criminal law in England and Wales, it would have to be the English and Welsh disregard scheme that they would have to apply for. If it was under military rules, then it would be for the military to put in place a disregard scheme or a pardon scheme, um, it, 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 which would be reflective of how the military rules process operates as well. Um, to be frank, I think it would be difficult to... I think it must be difficult for the MOD to come back and say, no, I don't think we should do anything. You know, if we have a, if we have a scheme in England and Wales, and we're about to introduce a scheme here in Scotland, um, uh, which is a cross-party support, um, I think it would be difficult for the MOD to say anything other than we're going to look at this and try and find a mechanism which allows us to introduce a disregard scheme or a pardon scheme about how their military rules uh, operate. And I would certainly want to encourage them to, uh, to do so. Um, it will be interesting to see what response you get from the Ministry of Defence. Um, if after the committee have had a response from them, uh, you feel it would be helpful for representation to be made from the Scottish Government on the matter, I'm more than happy to do that, particularly for um, service personnel who were based here in Scotland or who are uh, Scottish and if that um, assists in trying to get some focus on the matter, including uh, with the, uh, the Defence Secretary. But I, uh, I think it would be difficult for the MOD to... Uh, to come back with anything other than a positive uh, uh, 
confirmation that they are prepared to look at this and to try and find a mechanism that ensures that military rules are reflective of where wider society is at now, this issue. Thank you, Government Secretary. Um, I, again, it's not for me to preempt their response in any way. Um, certainly, uh, anecdotal discussions that we've had with individual members of armed forces mm -hmm. have all been very positive in that respect, that there's a cultural shift within that organisation as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hopeful that there's, there's certainly recognition of, of that issue. And I guess I just wanted to mention it because there may be uh, residents of Scot in Scotland who are wondering if this new legislation will, will help them in any way uh, with their experiences of, of being discharged or offences committed there. I, I suppose on one technical point, if someone had been convicted of a criminal offence or, or a, a, apologies, a common, common law offence in, in Scotland and uh, an armed forces uh, offence, then they could still apply for disregard with with regards to the, the the legal aspects of it, but perhaps not necessarily the, the military aspects. So. They can, yeah. Although the, the, the fact that it will still be on their military record, you know, that the, the, my understanding was in the past that there were individuals, for the very fact of being gay, uh, were uh, discharged from the military. Um, uh, and the fact that if their family go and look at their military record, uh, that will be recorded uh, for those reasons. And uh, it would seem reasonable to me that the military should be looking to correct that in the same way in which uh, we are seeking to do that through, through our, own criminal, uh, uh, our own criminal justice system. Thank you. We've seen some of the military acts last week as well, Cabinet Secretary, and some of the very stigmatising language that is included uh, in the acts that would have been uh, um, you know, imposed on people at the time. So uh, we're very grateful for um, your uh, support and the, the work that I think we will be taking forward with the MOD uh, in that. I've got a couple of supplementaries because was, as people have been sitting here, you've been talking, they've been coming up with more questions, which is always a good thing. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. Mine is very technical question it's also very small really because the numbers we're talking about in this act are very small but by for completeness we don't want to miss this opportunity to right wrongs across the board and, and we have to consider every possibility that might come forward and um one of the discussions that we had was about the case the reality that particularly um in the earlier period would discussing in terms of living memory, the, the sort of 50s and 60s, um, that occasionally people would be sentenced and, because, and to hide their shame and embarrassment would actually use assumed identities or, or um, an alias in, in that process. Um, are you content that if there were people in Scotland to whom that applied, were they to come forward for a disregard that they would be able to obtain that even though they might be applying for it through a different name? Do you mean they were they were they were convicted under a different name? Or yes, they, they were using an alias at that time. A, a range of that um, convicted Which under. I think it'd probably name. be a criminal offence itself. <laughs> yeah, so, that might be but, <laughs> so, admitting to fraud. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I'm 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 confident we have provision within it that if when we consider the the criminal records that the police hold and the court hold that we will be able to apply it. if someone's changed their name. Uh, since then. Um, uh, however, I think when it comes to criminal records, even when you change your name, your criminal records remain with you. It was more, it was more you. for the, um, the fact that the assumed identity may well have actually been a fraud in and of itself to avoid the embarrassment and the rest of it. So I think you've kind of answered my question there as well. So. I think they may want to consider very carefully they uh, want and, to and take legal that. advice. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I suspect the chances of something like that happen are very, very small. Yeah. We don't um, need to as well, that. yeah, and I think um, I, I, you know, we would certainly consider that. You know, I, I would, I would view, it, we would consider it as part of a disregard scheme and the mechanism we would go through if the person had used a, a, an alias at the time. And uh, a, 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 although, for the very reasons that I've mentioned to you, they may want to just take some advice before they make that application and highlight that point. Thank you, uh, Gail Wills. Thank you, convener. Um, I just recalled something that came up in another evidence session, and it was um, the issue about the definitions in the bill. Are there provisions for people who have maybe changed their gender since they were convicted? So is there provisions for them to make an application through a disregard scheme? If, the, if, they've, if they've changed their gender and uh, they still have a criminal record, uh, and uh, it, it's uh, identified as their criminal record, uh, and they were prosecuted, then yes, uh, that would continue to be the case. 
Uh, because the reality is that if someone changes their gender, their criminal record remains with them as well. Uh, and any previous convictions they had uh, remain with them. Uh, so, yes, they would still be covered by the, the legislation as it stands. <coughs> Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions about um, record keepers, because the regulations um, at Section 10.5 would list the relevant record keepers. And I just wonder if, the, if Cabinet Secretary, if you've given any thought yet to what that comprehensive list of record keepers would look like, and if you could share it with us, and whether or not that list should be done by negative or affirmative SSI. Mm -hmm. um, Dealing with your latter point, can I just come back and clarify that in okay. terms of the procedure we're going to use that? Uh, principal record keepers will be um, uh, Criminal Records, Police Scotland, uh, and the other ones will be the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service uh, that will hold records on these matters for the court uh, uh, element of the process. The only other area of record keeping which would be is the, is the national records, um, of course, as well. Uh, in terms of procedure, have we... It's negative procedure. Negative procedure. Uh, uh, that will be used for taking that forward. But the, the two principal areas where the records will be held will be with Police Scotland Criminal Records and with the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service. Okay. And, and the other question I wanted to ask you was with the records that are held by the National Records of Scotland, because it's something that we have proved, probed in previous evidence sessions, because we will be um, unable to delete or remove anything from the, the national um, records. Now, there is a view that's been expressed by the equality organisations that if we could do that, we would, in effect, be changing history. And it's really important that um, we, we don't try to change or remove anything that, that, that has happened. But the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service have said that they would be um, open to perhaps adding something <coughs> onto the national records to say that Whilst this conviction is there, it would no longer be a conviction if it happened today. And I'd be interested in your views on that. Uh, well, the reality is that when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to national records for individuals, uh, they don't become available until a hundred years after someone's death. Uh, so they're not going to be records that people will um, that will be able to have access to in uh, in the near future. Um, I, I can check with, with the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service exactly how they would want to achieve that as well. I'm not instinctively opposed to it um, uh, as well, but I do think, I agree, I think it's an important part of our history in recognising that that was a period in our history where we got it wrong, uh, badly wrong. And, uh, and part of learning for the future is uh, reflecting in the past. And uh, it, it is an important part it's important that we recognise that. So, uh, yes, I'm happy to, to check with the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service how they would they would seek to achieve that. And if there is a, a mechanism that they believe that they can achieve that through, then uh, that can be done so. Having said that, that will only, of course, apply to those who uh, uh, go through the disregard scheme um, as well, uh, and it won't apply to others. And uh, it, I'm also conscious that if they're comparing two sets of records, uh, one has... Uh, a correction because the person has actually applied through a disregard scheme and the other hasn't. Does that imply in some form of guilt or there's a difference there in some way? So anyway, um, uh, notwithstanding that, I'm happy to uh, check with the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service how they would seek to achieve that. And if there is a mechanism where they're happy to make some corrections to uh, uh, the national records to highlight this, then, uh, you know, if that can be really achieved, I'm happy to, to, to support them in doing that. OK, thank you for that. OK, mm -hmm. thank you. Just to follow on from uh, um, Mary's question there, the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service raised some concerns regarding extract convictions uh, and how how we get an agreement on information sharing of specially sensitive information. Have you got any comment on that, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, I can't give you any more information on that, but what we are doing is engaging with the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service to try and help to address any of these concerns and to make sure there is a mechanism that we... Uh, can get access to the, the appropriate information um, as well. So uh, at this stage, I'm uh, hopeful we'll be able to address their concerns uh, uh, and allowing the, in the disregard scheme to apply.
Okay. And on that issue about uh, sharing a, a sensitive information, you mentioned earlier about an agreement across a number of EU countries of sharing some sensitive data, especially in relation to uh, child sexual abuse. And I think in human trafficking as well, is that? Is it that could right? be, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. There'll, there'll be, uh, well, that, uh, we, for a whole range of different uh, criminal matters, we, uh, through Europol, etc., we exchange information in a whole range of jurisdictions across Europe. But specifically, this is with regards to uh, Disclosure Scotland yeah. uh, and information which they can get access to in other jurisdictions. Have we got any reassurance that Brexit won't affect that? <laughs> um, well, I don't know what reassurance I can give you about Brexit uh, one way or the other, <laughs> okay. to be honest with you. But I, uh, 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 I suspect, well, look, I suspect that the scheme which is in place... Um, will have some European provisions around it, although it applies, I think, to only 12 countries uh, at the present moment. So it's obviously not pan-European across all uh, uh, members of the European Union. Uh, I need to check whether there is going to be an impact, but uh, look, there's absolutely no doubt uh, the exchange of criminal information uh, post-Brexit is going to be more challenging than it is at the present moment. Uh, the nature of and the extent of the challenge uh, will be variable depending on what the final outcome is, but there will be challenges. Well, you can see why elements of the continuity bill will be of interest to this committee uh, in areas like this, and especially equalities and uh, rights and human rights. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, things like uh, European arrest warrants. Um, keep in mind that one of the provisions around European arrest warrants is it's a fast-track extradition. Um, extraditions are normally dealt with through treaties. Uh, very often the treaties that were in place previously have uh, since uh, been extinct. Yeah. Uh, so you are back into treaty arrangements if you can't use European arrest warrants and the timeline is much greater. Uh, an extradition uh, that, that I normally deal with can take about nine months, whereas a European arrest warrant, uh, you know, normally they're executed and, and used within about 40 days. So uh, this process is much quicker. But there is no doubt uh, in my mind, and I've set this out previously in Parliament, is that there will be significant consequences on our criminal justice system as a result of Brexit. Uh, and a key part of that will be the flow and exchange of information. Yeah, um, I think a bigger, much bigger topic for, for a, a, another, uh, probably many committee sessions to come. Just finally, Cabinet Secretary, we, we had written to uh, Disclosure Scotland on what actions they could take in order to maybe highlight on the form when people are making a, a disclosure application that you may have the right to have this conviction disregarded because they hold some of that information already and it was about increasing that awareness. We got an incredibly positive response back very, very quickly from Disclosure Scotland on that with a number of areas where they think they can work very effectively in, in many of the areas of information sharing, information gathering and raising awareness of this, this actual act. I was wondering if you were aware of that response that we've got from Disclosure Scotland and what work maybe your officials are doing uh, to realise some of the aims in it. We, we have a, a, a copy of the letter uh, that the committee received on this matter which is very helpful mm -hmm. um, as well and I'll certainly be encouraging them to, to provide what ongoing work they can uh, to help to support the introduction of the bill and to put provisions in place to highlight uh, these issues but yeah it is, it's very helpful uh, and I think it's one of the ways that we can help to make sure that people who uh, uh, may be thinking about applying is that it's brought to their attention that they can apply because public information campaigns only go so far mm -hmm. um, and uh, something like this it's, uh, uh, that's highlighted to individuals could be very useful. Excellent, thank you. Is there any other questions from colleagues? We have eventually exhausted our questions to you this morning, Cabinet Secretary. We'll be working on our Stage 1 report and we'll hopefully get that to the government uh, as soon as that's completed, but uh, we're very grateful for your evidence this morning and uh, the support from your officials in the process of Stage 1 uh, uh, this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now going to suspend committee to go into private.